We are called the Green Devils. Our motto is, you never gain anything if you are not willing to risk everything. In 1941, Fritz Mithäufer was a sergeant and a paratrooper in the Feischemjäger Division. Today he is a service representative for an automobile agency in Hollywood, California. In 1941, Gordon Laburn Smith was a captain in the Royal Australian Artillery, assigned to the defense of Crete. Today, an architect, he lives in Stirling, South Australia. People are inclined to regard war either in heroic or sentimental terms. As far as I'm concerned, all the war did to me was to make me grow up. On the Aegean island of Crete, the lives of Gordon Laburn Smith and Fritz Mithoyfer came together for a brief moment. Two fighting men, one Australian, one German, relived that moment in history. March 1941. In five months of bitter fighting, the legions of Mussolini have failed to conquer Greece. Hitler comes to the rescue of his Axis partner with Blitzkrieg. Within one month, the swastika flies over the Acropolis. British expeditionary troops are forced to evacuate to the island of Crete. On the 1st of May, 1941, over 27,000 disorganized British, Australian, and New Zealand soldiers are evacuated to Crete, an important British base covering Greece, Turkey, Palestine, and Suez. One of these soldiers, a troop commander in the 23rd Australian Field Regiment, is Captain Gordon Laburn Smith. We land in Crete with no equipment whatever, not even a rifle amongst us. The troops generally are fit, but very, very tired and units which have been badly split up and they came off the evacuation beaches have to be regrouped. We're completely exhausted and the first two weeks we spend under the olive trees around Suda Bay just resting and trying to build up our strength. There is a large remnant who having no leaders are inclined to roam around in bands as we are unequipped, we remain in the Sudabray area. The men and officers who have arrived on Crete are bitterly aware of their recent defeat. The supplies of ammunition and equipment are inadequate. Air protection is practically non-existent. Crete is 160 miles long. It possesses a large deep water harbor at Suda Bay and three airfields at Malimi, Ritimo and Iraklion. Whoever controls Crete dominates the East Mediterranean. The German general staff has maintained that mastery of the Eastern Mediterranean is dependent on the capture of Crete. Having conquered Greece, the question of Crete must now be settled. It is the method of invasion that is open to debate. The Germans are aware of the might of the British fleet so Reichsmarschall Goering urges an invasion by air. Only Hitler hesitates. The paratroop corps represents the elite of the youth movement. Goering is persistent. Hitler issues directive number 28. The flower of the German Reich will form the backbone of Operation Mercury, set for May 20th. One of these paratroopers, in training with the crack 7th Airborne Division, is Sergeant Fritz Mithäufer. The training is very difficult. We learn to fall onto ground that is nearly as hard as concrete. We are trained in offensive action only, never how to defend ourselves. If we ask an officer about defense, he looks at us as if we were mad. When we have successfully passed these tests, we are allowed to jump. Parachute jumping is wonderful, 
one comes down so slowly, so peacefully. It is quite a sport. On May 12th, British intelligence reports a German invasion of Crete is imminent. The defending force on the island, known as Cree Force, is composed chiefly of Greeks, New Zealanders, and Australians. Churchill states that the island will be defended to the last man. Our positions are well concealed. We're excited at the prospect of once more meeting up with the Germans. We're expecting an attack, but as the days wear on, rather hope it will never come. These first days are particularly wearing, as food is extremely light on, and having nothing in particular to do, we brood far too much on the fact that the only planes we see are German, and they are almost continually overhead. There is no doubt about it, the Germans are having it all their own way. About the 14th of May, things brighten up considerably when rumour goes round that there are some guns available and that our regiment is to take them over. On the next day, four Italian 75s arrive, towed by trucks, and I am given command of these in order to take them to a place called Georgiopolis. We are very confident that we will be able to deal with anything the enemy offers, so long as we are not bombed into the ground beforehand. Under Operation Mercury, the Germans plan to land 15,000 men from the air, a unique development in the art of warfare. An additional 7,000 men will invade the island from the sea. The German objectives take the airstrip at Malimi and the towns of Hanya, Ritimo, and Iraklion. On the morning of May 20th, 1941, the German airborne forces are ready. Our officers have briefed us. We can expect light enemy resistance. We are confident that our objectives can be captured quickly. totals over 1,200 aircraft, including 500 Yonker transports and hundreds of gliders. The first airborne army is on its way to its first test. May 20th, 1941, 7 a.m. The German invasion force appears over the island of Crete.
of us are light-hearted. We tell jokes and laugh and keep up our morale this way. I do not give a soul to dang because I'm sure that I will live. I'm at my observation post on the top of a hill. Suddenly, the whole ground seems to shake with the throbbing noise of approaching planes. We are told, prepare to jump. Then comes the order, ready to jump. The moment has arrived, the word comes, go. The sky is filled with hundreds of varied colored shoots. A British soldier remarks that they look like balloons coming down at the end of a party. We have a perfect grandstand view. As a spectacle, the landings are magnificent. They come down endlessly. Most of the shoots are white, but some are red, others blue. The little figures hanging on the ends of the parachutes look not so much formidable as pathetic. Many of the paratroopers land on top of the waiting British. The invasion is off to a bad start when the gliders in which the commanding general and his staff are traveling crashes on takeoff. The command quickly passes to other hands, but not without confusion. In spite of staggering losses, the gliders and transports managed to land more than 5,000 men in the area of the Malimi airfield, the main target. Actually, at 11 a.m., more German transports appear and drop equipment and ammunition to the waiting paratroopers. The Australian troops at Malemi capture a complete German battle plan and succeed in breaking the code. Cree Force troops are able to signal the German transports into dropping ammunition and food supplies to them instead. gives us as much support as they can, but there is much confusion. Many of our high officers have been killed and one cannot get definite orders or information. We have had heavy casualties. The British are well covered in ditches and trenches. We try to remember all the things we were told in training. from battalion to regimental headquarters to keep them in touch with each other. I must get the messages through at whatever cost. I have strict orders to stay away from any action, but this is impossible. There is fighting going on everywhere. The results of the first day's fighting are costly for the Germans. The death knell has been sounded for the 7th Parachute Division, whose casualties are enormous. 
Hitler is so alarmed that he forbids the Berlin radio to mention the invasion until the outcome of the battle is absolutely certain. Messages from Retamo and Arachnion indicate that the fighting there is going well for us. But it's apparent that conditions at Malamy have deteriorated badly. We must hold out here. If the Malamy airstrip is lost, the whole of the island can be lost too. By nightfall, the airfields at Retimo and Iraklian remain in the hands of the British. But at Malimi, the situation is perilous. Islanders at Malimi have failed to counterattack during the night, with the result that the Germans have obtained a foothold on the airfield. Now the Germans throw half a battalion of paratroopers into this position, oblivious to losses. Our commander has told us, push on. We move about 100 or 200 yards at a time. It is ambush fighting, and I don't like it. However, Stukas fly over and give us some protection. Our morale goes up when we see the planes. The Germans continue to bring in their men and their bombers are almost always overhead. Without any air power, it's quite impossible for our troops to attack. fire all day onto the aerodrome. Several men have been wounded and are sent to the rear. One gun has gone out of action due to mechanical failure, but a chap remains at his post, calmly repairing the weapon. The Malimi airfield is now fully operational and German strength increases rapidly. On the morning of May 21st, a portion of the British fleet is subjected to heavy air bombardment. The cruiser Juno is hit and sinks within two minutes. That evening, the Royal Navy intercepts a German troop convoy off the coast. sink a dozen German caiques and three steamers loaded with invasion troops. A few hours later, another German landing force is routed. 5,000 reinforcements fail to reach Crete. On the 23rd, the British pay a heavy price for their tactical victories of the two preceding days. German fighters catch the entire Mediterranean fleet without fighter protection. to the British, one battleship, four cruisers, and eight destroyers, sunk or out of action, and other units severely damaged. The fleet is forced to withdraw. May 26th, continuous air bombardment has reduced the British forces to small, isolated, and immobile units. Both sides pay heavily for this island. Germans, near exhaustion because of the heavy fighting of the last few days and running low in ammunition, make a desperate assault on Hanya, the doorway to Suda Bay. After a night 
spite of intense fighting, the Germans managed to breach the British lines. The front is broken, and further British resistance becomes futile. The Australians and New Zealanders are tough fighters. When we approach their lines, we are worried. But we find their positions are empty most of the time. They have left, pulled back. Maybe they find out that we are ready to move in. Certainly, the end of this fighting will not be far off. Early in the morning of May 27th, the decision is taken to evacuate Crete. The last retreat from Europe begins. From now on, it is a matter of getting back to the beach at Sparkia in the best order that we can. The withdrawal is carried out superbly and at no time turned into a rout. The roads do not appear to be filled with troops and the guns always have easy travelling without traffic jams. The infantry moves back steadily, if wearily. The whole effect is curiously gentle, but this is still the gentleness of a wild beast worn down by the hunting pack, but still quite willing and eager to rip and tear if approached too closely. The Germans are still to find that we are not yet beaten, and they are given no chance to rush us or to hurry us. We are hungry, we are tired, we are angry. And we cannot or will not understand why we are once more moving in the wrong direction. If we must move this way, we will do it in our own time. The Germans can occupy the ground behind us, but only at our pleasure. Fifteen thousand British are saved from the rocky beaches, but thirteen thousand are left behind, killed or captured. This is the final bitterness. Ahead of us, looms long years of heartbreaking prison life, but this is in the future. At present, we are too near exhaustion to even think. I'm proud to say that the men who are forced to surrender on the beach at Svakia, my friends from Australia, New Zealand, and the United Kingdom, are still undefeated. Within 10 days, Crete has fallen. Laburn Smith, taken prisoner on the beaches of Spakia, will spend four long years in Germany before being liberated on VE Day. Fritz Mithäufer will leave Crete to fight in the Russian campaign. Later at El Alamein, he is captured by the British. Crete was quickly won, but at a staggering loss. In the very skies in which, according to legend, Greek gods first took flight. Both stories ended in tragedy.